If your friend led you into an uncharted cave inhabited by man-eating half-humans, what would you do? In this how to be video, we'll follow the amateur cavers, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the crawlers in the descent. Think you can do better? Let us know in the comments. Enjoy these how to be videos? Like and subscribe. Have a movie you'd like me to cover? Reply to this comment. We all have Netflix or some streaming service. Problem is, you're virtually detained by your country. In this digital world of freedom, that's just wrong. With Atlas VPN, you can supercharge your streaming service for $1.39 per month to gain access to better prices and more content by becoming a cyber resident in all the countries with geofenced movies and TV shows. Want to watch The Avengers, The Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter? All you have to do is open Atlas VPN, connect to the country with the movie you want to watch, in this case it's Canada, reload Netflix, and grab your popcorn. Many services like YouTube Premium, Netflix, and Spotify Spotify have their pricing adjusted based on different regions. By switching your location to India, for example, the service price will see a huge drop. How does Atlas VPN do it? When you connect to an Atlas VPN server, your device is given a new IP and DNS address. All of your traffic is encrypted and routed towards the VPN server, where Atlas decrypts it and allows the traffic to access the desired destination. Atlas VPN also has a whole suite of other great features like its data breach monitor. Pop your email address into the tool and it'll scan the internet to see if your email and password accounts were compromised in a data breach, so you know to change them. Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their three-year deal for just $1.39 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. The deal won't last for long, so make sure to check it out by clicking the link in the description. All right, let's get to it. We start out following three sassy, adventurous ladies whitewater rafting. After they break through the rapids, Paul shares a moment with Juno before driving home with his wife and daughter. He starts daydreaming about slowly taking off Juno's wetsuit while behind the wheel and veers out of his lane. That was some final destination sh**. Paul may have cheated death prior to this, but honestly, it was straight up his fault for daydreaming about being his wife's friend. He should have saved those thoughts for later when his wife and kids weren't in the car with him. Still, who the hell thought strapping an open PVC pipe to their roof and loading it with a bunch of copper rods was a good idea? They're definitely getting charged with manslaughter for catapulting half a dozen metal javelins through Paul and Jessica's faces. Sarah wakes up in the hospital bed, clueless as to what happened. She rips off all the wires, tubes, and gadgets she's hooked up to so she can wander the hospital to find someone who can bring her up to speed. I think they have little buttons on the beds that alert the staff. You can just push that and not rip out all the important stuff that's probably keeping you alive. Oh, it was a PTSD nightmare. Yeah, I guess it makes sense that you'd be fairly distraught and impulsive. Juno's gotta be feeling a little guilty about sending Sarah's husband bedroomized pre-crash. One year after the incident, Sarah, Juno, and Beth get back together to go spelunking in the Appalachian Mountains. They're joined by two inexperienced sisters, Sam and Rebecca, as well as Juno's half-reckless, adrenaline-junkie base jumper friend, Holly. Holly laments that the cave they're about to explore is just a tourist trap that offers no real challenges and probably has a gift shop in it. I haven't read the brochure for the cave diving adventure you're embarking on, but I have read the synopsis of this movie and I gotta say, I'm not sure we're talking about the same cave. Sarah seems resentful of Juno for ditching her the day after the crash, as she should be, and is obviously still traumatized by the horrific loss of her family. I mean, she's keeping antidepressants bedside to cope with her night terrors. <laughs> All this to say, taking Sarah spelunking with two noobs being led by the person she resents who will be encouraged to push her limits by her adrenaline addict friend doesn't seem like the greatest idea. Maybe it would be okay if the cave was a tourist trap with a gift shop inside, but I'm gonna guess that it's unmarked or was sealed up by the locals for a grave reason that they'll ignore. Holly mentions that it's a level 2 cave in the fictional Boreham Caverns. I'm not sure level 2 is even a thing. What cave they think that they're headed into doesn't really matter because Juno left the guidebook in the glove box for some stupid reason. Worth mentioning that everyone in the group should have a copy of the guidebook or map of the cavern that they're entering in case they get separated or lost, or, you know, so they can actually find their way around. On their two mile long hike to the entrance of the tourist trap, they run into the throat cut carcass of a bull elk. 
nature, or bad omen. They reach the entrance and everyone repels in. Sarah notices what looks like a blood-stained handprint on the wall and neglects to tell anyone about it because it's probably nothing, just like the elk was probably just attacked by a bear. <laughs> Sarah looked like she was about to get impaled by a copper rod. I still don't think bringing a PTSD-stricken person cave diving was a good idea. Sam asks which way they need to go next. Juno replies that there's only one way out of this chamber, down the pipe. Before hard holstering her ice climbing axe? Why does she have an ice climbing axe? Why is everyone following someone who brought an ice climbing axe into a cave that has no ice? If ice climbing axes were required tools for this expedition, why is Juno the only person with one? It's not looking good here. You know what would have been a good idea? Bringing ascenders instead of a fucking ice climbing axe so you can climb out the way you came in in case the tunnel's blocked, flooded, your equipment fails, or you run into homicidal cave golems. The cave very well could be flooded, with all the water pouring into it. I'm also gonna take a hot guess and say that they didn't inform the park rangers, let alone any one of their plans. Once inside the cave, they light some flares and hang out for a few. Sarah hears the giggling of her deceased child and wanders off by herself to see if Jessica got a head start on them. Can't wait to see how she does in the claustrophobic confines of the next tunnel they have to go through. Not well. Sarah gets stuck both mentally and physically. Beth goes back and pretty much does everything right. Tells her to breathe slowly, cracks some jokes, and tries to lead her out. The problem is that this cave is experiencing tectonic shifts for some reason. Good thing nobody was on the other side. Or wait, that would be bad because they didn't bring any ascenders or let the park rangers know their whereabouts. And according to Juno, the only way out is down the pipe, so going back wasn't an option anyways. According to the guidebook, According to the guidebook nobody brought, which from your memory contradicts what Juno said about there only being one way out. You didn't say anything at the time and now you're here. Turns out Juno was bullshitting them and led them down a different unmarked cave so that everyone would be dependent on her so she could play the fearless leader role. Needless to say, it backfired hard. Leading a group of noobs into an unmarked, unmapped cave that nobody knows you're at is unbelievably reckless. The fatal accident in the Nutty Putty Cave serves as a stark warning of this. Even in well-mapped caves with experienced cavers who had expert backup, a man still lost his way and got irretrievably stuck. The fact that this is an unmapped cave means that there might not be a way out at all, which means Juno is even more of an idiot, if that was possible, for not bringing ascenders to climb out the way they came. And Juno was concerned about Holly being reckless. Speaking of, if Holly had experienced Borham Caverns previously, Obviously, she must have known Juno was leading them elsewhere and didn't say anything. Both of you are untrustworthy bitches. Still, it's not all on Juno and Holly. In caving, the consequences for entering the wrong cave are exceedingly high. Everyone should have been checking their guidebooks and making sure that they were in the right area and going into the right cave. Juno is right about one thing. If they stay, they die. While everyone's fighting, Sarah's scouting around with her headlamp. Have you any idea who she's been with? No, could you couldn't get strange, but she doesn't say anything. I could see her passing this off as more PTSD hallucinations or the darkness playing tricks on her eyes. The clicking sounds could be passed off as more bats or something. The journey deeper into the cave in search of an exit is halted by a gigantic underground precipice. Judging by the time it took for that rock to hit the ground, a fall would be fatal. Juno pops some flares and spots a tunnel across the cavern. Could be a dead end, but they don't really have any other options. Rebecca volunteers to trad climb the overhang and rig up a line using cams. Nice of you to volunteer and maybe you are the only trad pro here, but shouldn't the self-proclaimed badasses Juno or Holly be the default choice for this high-risk operation considering they got you all into this mess? <laughs> I'm not a trad climber, but I do rock climb and have some general experience. Firstly, I wouldn't clip a giant power drill on my harness when I'm traversing an overhang. The trad gear is heavy enough and dead hanging from a ceiling is hard enough. Secondly, some of those cam placements and flared wedges look a bit sketchy, and she's not giving them a tug check before placing her weight on them. I get she's limited on options though. When she goes for her third cam placement, she finds an old bolt which had to have been placed by a human explorer. Might as well 
well use it, even though you'll probably just be following them to the dead end where they died. If whoever explored this cavern had made it out, it would have been in the brochure. I'm sorry, I'm not being optimistic. I'm sure that the explorer found a ground break just around the bend. I'd still place my own cam somewhere around it. Why solely trust your life to an old bolt some other dumbass who came down here placed? That was the first bolt she found on the overhang, meaning the other bolts they placed must have been shallow and zippered out on a fall. Rebecca makes it across and rigs up a line that they can shuttle across. Juno is the last across, and instead of shuttling over like everyone else, she decides to clean the route in case they need the gear again. Cleaning the route is a bit risky. Rebecca's cams were hastily placed and not to be relied upon. I think Juno should have shuttled across, and if they needed the gear again, they could just go back and clean it. This play does put you on the wrong side of another tunnel collapse, though. Juno is struggling hard. Looks like we're going to be finding out if those cam placements were solid or not. <laughs> What the hell was Rebecca doing? There is no reason the rope should have slipped her hand like that. I don't think her figure eight belay device was set up properly. It doesn't look like the rope was looped around its neck. That and her hand wasn't in the brake position, which it should have been. Her belay gloves also suck because that little amount of rope slip caused enough friction burn to cut straight through her hand, forcing her to dump the rope. I want to say Juno was lucky because she wasn't also relying on Rebecca's cams, but I don't think that bolt is any better. Hey, at least you got your gear back. Further into the cavern, they find a mural. How did the homo sapien artist get up there to paint it? That's like 20 feet up on a smooth wall. Beth remarks that it's a map. There's the mountain they're under, with the cave that they're in, and two exits. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Even if it's a map and there is an exit, there's no directions as to where the exit is. Nobody notices Smeagol trailing them, so they blindly march onwards, only to end up at a fork in the cave. Juno, using her lighter as a barometer, catches an air current in one of the passages, which means it likely leads to the surface. At least she's a clever idiot. Holly mistakes phosphorescent rock for daylight, takes the idiot baton from Juno, and sprints down the corridor and falls into the mouth of another cave. <laughs> You dumb bitch. Escaping these tunnels would have been hard enough in full health. Now they have to haul you and your broken leg around too. At least they brought someone along with medical training. Well, she's a med student, so barely. Sam has everyone hoist Holly out of the water and applies traction to her leg to align the bone before splinting. Getting her out of the water mostly helps them check for blood loss. Aligning the bone most likely wasn't necessary. Her leg could have been immobilized in its current position and manipulating her leg just caused caused more pain, writhing, and damage. It does provide a strong dramatic effect though. No! Meanwhile, Sarah is tripping balls, playing hide and seek with her dead daughter. She finds an old rusty miner's helmet, which must have belonged to whoever put that bolt in. <gasps> Looks like he's not doing so well. Of course, nobody believes her. Why would they? Sounds psychotic, and Sarah's been known to have hallucinations. Sarah has the total opposite reaction that I would expect. She wants to see if that man thing she saw could help them find a way out. I don't even know what to say to that. If I was in this group and somebody told me that, sure, I wouldn't believe them but I'm gonna place myself in the middle of the pack just in case. The crew continues to follow the air current, which leads to a room filled with bones of dead animals, and probably some humans. I'd say this is ample supporting evidence for Sarah's monster sighting. Best start fashioning weapons out of the bones and anything else you can find. Gino can't find a breeze and doesn't know which way they need to go, so Sam and the others start yelling for help like imbeciles. Yeah, good idea. Let's attract the thing that slaughtered hundreds of animals that were bigger, stronger, faster, and let's be honest, smarter than you. Hello? Finding the way out is your last priority right now. The exit could be a mile from here or non-existent. The last thing you want to do is line up in a single file on a confined space with these things attacking you. It would be better to all band up in the middle of the room with weapons in hand. You probably don't want to get up next to the wall with them climbing around like spider monkeys. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 
Wow, literally nobody stayed together. Now they're all easy targets to get picked off one by one. Juno puts up a hell of a fight against two of the golems and shanks one of them dead with her ice axe. Who knew that thing would come in handy? Beth runs back to help Juno, but Juno's in full rage mode. Probably shouldn't have snuck up behind someone who just fought to the death. So many movies do the whole friendlies almost kill each other thing, but back down before a fatal blow is dealt. I'm glad this movie took it there, because realistically, friendly fire happens a lot more than we'd like to admit. Rebecca's headlamp ran out of battery. Apparently, she decided that instead of packing spare batteries, she'd just bring a giant glow stick that's totally useless at lighting up the cave. So useless that she unwittingly walked right under another crawler. Now that there's a lull in the violence and the crawlers are distracted eating your friend, it's a good time to assess their strengths and weaknesses. Strengths, fast, good climbers, sharp teeth, sneaky. Weaknesses, they don't see so good, or Sarah would be dead. Basically, shut the f up, pick up something you can use as a weapon, and no, the glow stick doesn't count. Try to find your friends, try not to get separated from your friends, then try to quietly find a way out. The boneyard is proof that there is. If you're feeling frisky, and a couple of you are together and have fashioned a shiv out of animal bones, you can bait the creatures in front of you by tossing stones, then spear them through the neck or chest. Sounds dangerous, but it's better to be the hunter than the hunted. Or you could spoon each other in a corner while crying in hopes that your friends make a noise which distracts the monsters long enough for you to attempt an escape. Oh, now everyone pulls out their rice axes and knives. Where were those when you first got attacked? Sarah also uses her friend's unintentional diversion to spark up a fire torch out of an old oil can on the ground. Clever, but I'm not gonna award her any points for this. Having to be resourceful because of your piss poor planning means that you're still an idiot. Any caver worth their salt would tell you to bring a couple spare sets of batteries at least. Rebecca and Sam are trying to link up with the rest of their group. Difficult when you can't make any sound. Yeah, honestly, these things aren't that hard to kill if you can group up on them. I say sitting on my comfy couch in an air-conditioned apartment under zero threat of a gruesome death. They can hug it out somewhere else. The sounds of their fight and the crawlers screeching will attract more of them, and we don't know how many of them there are. Juno tells Rebecca and Sam about a way out, marked by the explorer that came before them, that it should lead them to the cave entrance which the man-eaters use to go outside and hunt animals. First, they need to find Sarah. Tall task, but it'd be damn hard to live with yourself if you just left her. Not sure why Juno holstered her ice axe. Might have that baby cocked back and ready to strike. Although Juno has been a bit trigger happy with it, so maybe holstering it was a good idea. Sarah finds Beth in the carnage. How the hell is she still alive? She took an ice axe through the neck. Beth tells her that Juno killed her and to not trust her. I know Juno pulled a dick move dragging you guys into this cave and wasn't the best friend, but to say that she's a murdering psychopath is crazy. You jumped up behind her when she was fighting for her life. You got caught in the crossfire. It was just a shitty case of friendly fire. Beth's lamentations are drawing the attention of the humanoids. Her dying wish is to have Sarah finish her off with a rock so she doesn't have to experience getting eaten alive. <laughs> love each day. Sarah doesn't even make it a step before another albino flesh eater descends on her. Sarah's in no mood for its shit and head stomps it like Ryan Gosling and Driver. <laughs> Best to get some distance from the commotion now. You gotta shoot and scoot with these fuckers. The caveman's girlfriend shows up for date night and finds what's left of his head after Sarah curb stomped him. Needless to say, she's pissed. Sarah makes a run for it and trips into the pond full of God knows what. Haven't we learned by now that running only makes things worse? Standing and moving so incredibly still that you become invisible is the best defense. And where is that pocket knife you had? She is smart to hold her breath, collect herself, and ever so slowly Navy Seal out of the crawler toilet so she doesn't make any more noise. Doesn't help her though. The albino bat bitch is onto her. Pocket knife. 
Where's your goddamn pocket knife? If everyone did a little preparation and planning, they wouldn't have to struggle for a Hail Mary every time they found themselves in a near-death situation. Sarah climbs up onto the rock and freezes when she hears another coming around the corner. It steps on her, but thinks it's just another animal carcass and moves past her. She carefully grabs another bone club, and by the look in her eye, it's time for vengeance. <laughs> So the tally is one for the crawlers and like five or six for the girls. As long as they have light, they have an immense tactical advantage. These creatures are only human and have all the same weaknesses. Sarah lets out a blood-curdling scream. I don't think she was doing it to get the attention of the others. However, if she was, outright screaming isn't the best way. Your friends may just think you got whacked. Best to yell something like, I'm okay, help me. This way they know that you aren't a goner and it wasn't a man-eater yelling or something. Juno and the others hear her scream and try to get to her, but when Juno turns the corner, she finds an entire family of these things. Juno's team is in a pretty good spot. The corridor is narrow enough that only one crawler can attack at once, but tall enough that she can stand and fight. She could pull a Leonidas and make this passage the proverbial hot gates. The last place you want to be is surrounded in the open, or forced into a crawl with them behind you. They opt to run for it, but get forced back to the precipice. So instead of pulling a Leonidas, you guys pulled a Persian. Sam, in an utterly moronic move, tries to trad climb back across the overhang. There's just no way to fight in that position. It's physically demanding, so you'll be making noise, it achieves literally nothing, and it goes about how you'd expect. <sighs> At least she took one of them with her. They all keep forgetting that after every noisy altercation, they need to relocate, and another crawler gives Rebecca an involuntary C-section. Juno's brain is misfiring from all the action, and ditches Rebecca to leap off the cliff into the water. She finds no salvation, though. You're telling me this thing was holding its breath this whole time after getting shanked and falling? Give me a break. Sarah jump scare pulls Juno up from the slippery rocks. She's lucky her face didn't catch an ice axe. Juno and Sarah go back to back Tomb Raider style against the rest of the crawler family. <laughs> Damn, some badass ladies. If there's more of them, they're definitely on their way. Unless you plan on fighting some more, I suggest you get moving. Sarah's got more vengeance on her mind and shows Juno the keychain that Beth grabbed from her neck. Even if Juno said that it was an accident, I don't think Sarah would believe her, based on Beth's account and Sarah's pre-existing grudge. Even if Sarah was convinced that it was an accident, with how many crawlers are on their ass, somebody's gonna have to take one for the team so the other can escape. <laughs> Sarah leaves the gimped Juno and makes a lucky break for the exit. The movie ends with Sarah's PTSD going nuclear. Let's recap the pivotal points where different decisions could have altered who lived and died. Whoever poorly secured those copper rods to the top of the car was a total idiot. Paul and Jessica might have survived the crash and there'd have been no need for a validation seeking reunion trip. Misleading your noob friends into the wrong cave with no ranger backup is a terrible idea. Full stop. Everyone should have had a copy of the guidebook and been checking the routes as they went. They would have realized that they were being led down the wrong cave before the tunnel collapsed and their fates were sealed. These things would have prevented the deaths of the innocent crawlers, which were just acting as animals do, as well as the deaths of Sam, Rebecca, Holly, Beth, Sarah's soul, and as far as we know, Juno. All said and done, I think we could have beaten the crawlers from the descent. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't go spelunking with egotistical lunatics or PTSD victims.